it off as if it isn't really all that significant, though it is the one emotion that will choke the word and make it unfruitful. As Jesus himself taught in Mark 4, the cares of this age, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust or the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. The one I have in mind of those three is the cares. It's the word for anxieties, worries. And most of us would have to admit that our worry list is longer than our prayer list. Every one of us has something heavy that weighs down on us and doesn't go away. And we will break the bow if we keep it always bent. To make matters worse, many of the truths that you would otherwise learn, being exposed to at this great school of devotion and learning and training, will be lost if you allow the cares, the worries, the anxieties to keep plaguing you. So at the beginning of this semester, I encourage you, even though I know you have cares and concerns that are very real, I urge you to make this semester different in that you determine you will rest your case with Christ. Casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That you will trust in him with all your heart and stop leaning on your own understanding. That you will leave the placement of your future in his hands and not be anxious about where you will serve or when you will get that call, or how you will be able to meet the financial demands that are upon you and never seem to go away, or how you will be able to find a way to recover or someone you love very much to recover from the current illness that's plaguing you or them, all in the category of anxieties. Uh, There's a lady who even has a good time with the problem as she writes a book called The Joy of Stress. (laughs) She includes a diet, the first diet that has finally worked for me. It's a stress diet. For breakfast, a half a grapefruit, a piece of whole wheat toast, no butter, Eight ounces of non-fat milk. For lunch, four ounces of lean, broiled, skinless chicken breast. One cup of steamed zucchini or squash. Herb tea, no sugar. One Oreo cookie. mid-afternoon snack, the rest of the package of Oreo cookies, (laughs) a quart of Rocky Road ice cream, a jar of hot fudge, dinner, (laughs) two loaves of garlic bread smothered in butter on both sides. Large pepperoni mushroom pizza, double cheese, thick crust. Large pitcher of root beer. Three Milky Way candy bars. An entire frozen cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer. I'll never forget years ago, I was going to watch the sports center after all the kids had gone to bed and I was alone in the family room just me and a glass of tea and the television and sitting there in my uh, PJs ready for that wonderful Sunday night uh, sportscast. 
And I thought, well, there's a, there's a little ice cream in the, in the freezer. I remember the kids getting it yesterday. And so I went over and pulled it out. It was an entire half gallon. And I thought, well, I, you know, all the other spoons are dirty. I get a big soup spoon to eat this with. So I thought I'll just shave off a little. And uh, about a third of the way down, I thought, man, I, I got I to gotta quit this. But <laughs> then a newscaster came on with a, a whole group of NFL teams. And, and I was now about halfway through this uh, at the end, I finished the entire half gallon and I put the rest in a microwave and drank the uh, <laughs> rest of the container. And, and then I thought, the, the kids are going are gonna to remember that this thing was in their pool. And so I rushed down to the grocery store and <laughs> midnight, thank the Lord, they were open and I got another brand new same brand. And so the next day, Colleen, our youngest, walked over to me and she said, Daddy, you ate all of that ice cream last night. I said, what? What? <laughs> yes, yes. I, you know, there's a, there's a moment between accusation and admission where the Lord does a real work on you. And I, I said, well, I've got to know, how did you know? She said, you know, I knew you'd be tempted so I took two little scrapes out of the top, and then when I lifted the lid off this morning, those scrapes weren't there. <laughs> she tricked me. <laughs> My own daughter tricked me. So when I talk about when I talk about anxiety and the struggle with eating too much and the, the battle with all the things that plague us, I am not telling you a problem you've got. I'm using a pronoun that's first person plural. And we are all there. I, I found myself before I ever hit the floor this morning, early, uh, two or three things that I, I thought I, I had got to get this thing resolved. I, and I thought, isn't that just like me? Before I've ever claimed a verse of scripture, I'm rehearsing the stuff of life. So we're all there. And Jesus knew we'd be there. And for that reason, at the end of the 11th of Matthew, he, he gives us a marvelous, marvelous promise that I return to often. This is not the kind of rest I'm encouraging that requires you to take half a day off. This is not a rest that Jesus speaks of that requires a sabbatical. This is not where you lay out a year so that you can sort of recover from the load. This is a rest that can go on midstream, right through our day. It's a mental, an emotional, a volitional rest. It is a deliberate entering into a world that is full of his peace without in any way escaping the demands of the day. Jesus begins his words in verse 28 with a gracious and simple invitation. Come. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come. We're not invited to come to church. We're not asked to come to some guru in Tibet and meditate. We're not invited to come to a religion, to come to the Holy Land, to come to a New Age state of mind channeled directly we're invited to come to him. Come to me. Come to me. Who's to come? All of us. 
Your name belongs there. My name. Our names. Come to me. Come on. And magnificently, uh, it, is, it is timeless. It is ageless. It is cross-cultural. It is limitless for all of us. You don't have to dress up. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to somehow earn a hearing. You come. You come just as you are without one plea. You just come to him. He's inviting us. Who is to come? All of us. We who are weary. The word suggests a weariness after struggle. Last um, Christmas Eve, we, we held... Uh, I forget how many Christmas Eve services we had, uh, maybe two. And in the, in the second one, there's a little more time after the meeting, and a lot of folks lingered. And one hollow eyed couple waited toward the end and walked up and sort of threw their arms around me. And I remembered as I saw their faces, the history that we have with them. Their son is in prison. He'll be there three more years before he'll be even up for pardon. These are good people. But they live constantly in the anxiety of their boy behind bars. He deserves to be, broke the law. And his crime required incarceration. It was fair, just, but it's harsh. And I could tell by the way Neil hang, hung onto my arm. And even though he, he is probably 15 years younger than I, I felt him like sort of trembling. And I knew he'd been struggling. And I thanked him for being a faithful dad. And I thank Leah for being a wonderful mother. I told them that our hearts go out to Kevin our youngest son, one of his best friends. And I said, we feel, all feel so helpless. And his mother said, tears just running down her face. She said, I didn't want to do this, but she said, every time a Christmas comes, I remember it's another Christmas without Kevin. She said, it's all I could do to go on. That's weariness. Heavy laden is another word that appears. Oh. Jesus knew the words to use, didn't he? Uh, weary and heavy laden. Come. Just come to me. Just put your arms around me. Fall back on me. Come to me. Weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you a peace that can't be explained. I'll give you a relief that nothing you can find in a bottle or in a prescription will relieve you. I'll give you a hope that you can't manufacture. I'll give you rest. I'll help you cease from the churning. I have a friend of mine who's written a book called The Churning Place, and he describes that place we all have somewhere in our abdomen, our chest, where we churn. Sometimes it's in my throat, and I can feel my heart beating in my throat. You ever help, had that happen? Anxious over something, you can count your heartbeats in your throat in your chest. He says, I'll give you rest from that. 
I'll relieve you there. Some time ago, my sister Lucy said to me, uh, babe, she said, which, uh, what's your favorite feeling? I had never been asked that before, and we were enjoying a meal together, and I thought for a few moments, and I said, well, sis, I guess it's uh, accomplishment. <laughs> Sounds like a driven man, doesn't it? And she said, yeah, I, I thought you'd say that. She said, that's not the best. The best is a relief. I think she's right. There's nothing like relief. Relief that comes from ah, finally getting the forgiveness from someone you've had conflict with over a period of time. And then there's now peace. The bridge is built back. Relief after an argument with your partner in life. Relief when the cop says, well, I'm not going to give you a ticket this time. There's a, there's a rush, there's a, there's a gush of <sighs> relief. That's the thought behind this word. Rest, refreshment, relief. I'll give you rest. How does he do that? Well, the invitation leads to a little instruction. He tells us that there's something we are to do, and uh, it'll, it'll have a great payoff. He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, that was a culture in which yokes were familiar to people. I can't remember. Maybe the last time I saw oxen yoked together, I was on the island of Okinawa, and this old Japanese farmer was, was plowing his rice paddy with a couple of oxen yoked together. Jesus uses words familiar to people of his day, and, and a yoke was familiar in those days. One man writes this about him. The word easy in the Greek text means well-fitting. My yoke is easy. And Paul would made of the ox was was brought and the measurements were taken the yoke was then roughed out and and the ox was brought back to have the yoke tried on the yoke was carefully adjusted so it would fit well not gall the neck of the patient beast the yoke was tailor made to fit the ox there's an old legend that Jesus once made as a carpenter the best ox yokes in all of Galilee. And that from all over the country, people came to him to buy the best yokes that skill could make. In those days, as now, shops had their signs above the door. The old story goes, hanging outside the carpenter's shop in Nazareth, my yokes fit well. Very few people in life will help make your life easier. I love it when Jethro came to Moses and urged him to delegate the load of work that he was living under. He said, Exodus 18, he said, son, it'll be easier for you. The people will benefit from it. I thought, how few people have ever come to me and said to me, as a result of doing this, it'd be easier. Oh, they come telling me how to do something faster, or more efficiently, or better. Jesus says, come to me and my rest will be well-fitting. My yoke will feel right. It'll make it easier. Usually, yokes are made for two to pull together. And he is alongside us. And as we slip into his rest, we yoke up with him. His burden is light. 
something great. When he pulls, he takes most of the load. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I don't know if what version of the Bible you use, but uh, the one I use is the uh, New American Standard Version. And uh, in this particular text, there's a change in font at the end of the 29th verse. If your notes that, there's a reason. That means in the NASB that it's a quotation. And to my surprise, the quotation, you will find rest for your souls, is tucked away in Jeremiah 6 from verse, about verse 10 to about verse 16. In fact, the quote itself is verse 16, precisely. In the English, it's the same. And it's an account of people who were rebelling against, against the Lord, the people of Judah. And they didn't, they didn't want his way. And, and so... He tells them in Jeremiah 6, uh, that the reason they didn't want his way is because they were in rebellion. Uh, and so he speaks for the Lord saying, I'm full of the wrath of the Lord. I'm weary with holding it in. Pour it out on them in the street. And uh, Jeremiah just unloads the truck of emotion and he admits from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, they're greedy for gain. From the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Imagine a life like that. And are they ashamed? They are not ashamed. In fact, there's a passage in that, there's a statement here that says, they don't even know how to blush. It occurred to me, I can't remember the last time I saw somebody blush. We're in a day in which there's no more blushing. There's no more sense of <gasps> a sudden jolt of shame over a sin or a failure that I, I knew better. And it's in that context, he says, thus says the Lord, stand by the way and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. Verse 16 of Jeremiah 6, you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. You can say that. You, you can say that. Or you can say, you know, I've heard enough today to know I've carried the load long enough. I can't hold up under it. There came a time in between my uh, next to last and last semester when Cynthia and I uh, took a trip to Houston. It was a cold January journey. And uh, I remember we were leaving church that Sunday afternoon in, in uh, Houston and, and we were driving back to my folks' little home in East Houston and on the way the streets were icy and uh, a drunk driver never slowed as we began to cross a green light and he ran a red light and crashed into our car and, and drove the engine to the, over on the other side of the, the right front tire. And my side was crushed in and our little boy, Kurt, was back in the days when there weren't seat belts. He was standing in the front seat and was thrown into the windshield and broke his jaw. Cynthia was thrown into the gear shift and uh, was bruised and, uh, on her side. And we had already gone through a miscarriage. And she was pregnant with our, our baby. And uh, our car was totaled. Uh, we were already at the peak of pressure trying to get finished through our years at seminary. And, and they had been such great years and yet so full of pressure. And, I thought, this is the absolute end. <laughs> and we took our boy to the hospital, and we're sitting there. We don't know a soul. We don't know a doctor. 
Uh, my folks didn't even know what had happened. They went on to get the lunch ready, and so we're, all, we're sitting there, and Kurt's jaw is off to the side. And I just held him in my arms, and I pulled Cynthia close. We had a doctor come by, and he said, I, I need to get a specialist for this. This is, this is really a very difficult situation. And I thought, well, hurry up. Hurry up. And I prayed, and I looked down at our little Kurt, and uh, his jaw was back. <laughs> I thought, I must be seeing things. You know, great man of prayer. Lord, heal my son. He heals him, and I go, must be something. I didn't. You know, couldn't be a healing, you know. I don't have any gift like that. And, and, uh, and the Lord healed. In fact, uh, the doc came, a pedi- pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeon, and he he looked at him and he said, my, Eddie, let me look at that x-ray again because they had taken x-rays and then he took another x-ray and it was right in line. <laughs> and uh, that was the first of a whole series of things that God began to do. And In fact, he said to us something funny as we were leaving. He said, I don't have to touch him. It, it's, it, there's nothing to do. Uh, he said, just don't let him fall. Well, he was two years old. <laughs> thought, you dodo, you made no great medicine, but you don't know two-year-olds. And Kurt <laughs> fell about five or six times that afternoon, as I recall. And, but, you know, it, it, it was great. Anyway, got back, and uh, I'd missed what we used to have, the seating of the seniors, and I'd missed, uh, you know, the beginning of the second semester of that last year. And I remember thinking, uh, <laughs> this is going nowhere. I'm not sure I'm going to get through this place. And for the first time, early one morning, that first week back, I came across Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It was a turning point. I shared it with Cynthia, and she remembered Hebrews 4, 1 to 11, and we read it together. It says we're to labor to enter into that rest. Meaning it isn't just automatic. So you start the day laying it before the Lord. Whatever is here, it's yours. Whatever the pressure, you're able, I'm not. Whatever the demands that are outside my control, I, they're outside. I, I can't, I'll do my part as best I can. But Lord, you got to take up the slack and, and it's all yours. And I just give it all to you. And we began to do that. We, would, we began to meet each morning together. And regularly, we would just sort of together unload, unpack the stuff. What a difference it made. That last semester at the beginning of ministry that began to unfold to my surprise and amazement. I thought that's the secret. It's turning it all over and taking in return his rest. It works. It really works. He doesn't lie to us. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Came across an old legend that I want you to hear. This old codger was lost in the desert, dying for a drink of water. He stumbled upon an old ramshackle place, windowless, roofless, weather-beaten, He looked all around for a little shade from the heat of the desert sun and he slumped down under the eave of this this old shack and his, his eye caught in the distance an old rusty pump. He stumbled over to it and grabbed the handle. Squeak, 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 squeak. Nothing came out. He turned to go sit back down. He saw a jug, an old jug sitting there. And... uh, he, he found this note on it, yellow with age. You have to prime the pump with all the water in the jug. Be sure you fill the jug again before you leave. He pulls the cork off, looks inside the jug, and there's old, stale, hot water. He's got a decision. There's enough in the jug to satisfy his thirst. But if he drinks that, he could get sick. Furthermore, He'll never know if there's something in the pump. So he's standing there in the dilemma and reluctantly decides to pour it all in the pump, just like it says. Squeak, 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 nothing. 
and suddenly a little drop. And he pumps and pumps and pumps, and there more comes. And finally, there's a gush of fresh, cool water that comes like a stream. And he washes himself, and he drinks from it, and he drinks from it, and he drinks from it. And then he puts a jug underneath it, and he fills it up with water. And he adds this to the note. Believe me, it really works. But you have to give it all away before you can get anything back. Bow with me, please. I don't know what it is you have to give away. I don't know what it is that's just stolen your peace and turned seminary for you into one pressure point after another. I don't know what it is that has you anxious. If I knew, I'd call your name and I'd name it and I'd put my arms around you and pray specifically for that. Since this invitation is to all, I invite all of us to hand it all over to him. Just let it go. Let him take it. Trade all of those worries and all of that anxiety for his easy-fitting yoke and his light burden. Our Father, we thank you for your ministry to us in the quiet few moments of this chapel hour. Thank you for knowing who we are and where we are. Thank you for understanding our end from our beginning. Thank you for this path of faith that at times seems nothing but pressure and demand until we come to a moment like this when we realize you've been there all the time. You understand. We love you for that. In fact, Father, we adore you. And we lay our lives before you. In the loving